so it's a pleasure to be here. It's a very interesting two weeks in Zagreb and Slovenia. Um, and I would like to thank Mariana uh, Glavica, uh, Gl Glavica, I think. I'm trying to get the pronunciations right. She's a librarian at the faculty. Uh, Alexander Joksic, who's not here, um, a, stu a PhD student in philosophy. Uh, Milovov uh, Vodopaya, I see here. Vodopia. Vodopia, sorry. A uh, professional translator recommended by the United States Embassy uh, for their help in getting me access to the book that uh, Pavla mentioned and another article from the 1930s that are unknown in the United States. They're in several Croatian, that's how they're listed, I guess Croatian now you say. Um, and um, they helped me with the translations, especially Milovoy, uh, going directly from the Cyrillic and Croatian. So I'll be speaking of that one in particular, the one by Smertl. Um, and I spoke with his son, who's an ex-medical professor. Thank you very much for putting me in touch. Delightful conversation. Um, my gratitude is also extended to Avica uh, Bakovic, Bakovic um, who teaches here in Slavic drama for his translation of a Macedonian text that I understood um, only summarily before through its French praisi, which was a very extensive French praisi. <laughs> Uh, which itself introduced me to Smertl. That's how I found out about Smertl. And I'll, I'll talk also about the Macedonian, uh, which came from the Smertl. I'm doubly lucky to have caught uh, Evitsa at this period because he just successfully completed his doctoral defense and so was probably much more relaxed and enthusiastic than if I had arrived six months ago. Finally, I especially wish to thank Pavel Grigorich the right way here, of the Department of Philosophy, who was also Vice Dean for Research at the Center for Croatian Studies, for his assistance in the many related matters and for giving me this opportunity to get feedback on some of my new ideas. And I, I do want to make this interactive. I want to hear what people have to say because it is a very shocking thesis that I have and have had for 10 years. Um, and fortunately, some people are supporting me in print. But a 450-year-old tradition is hard to break, so you can imagine the kind of criticisms I will get, and I would like to be prepared for them. So feel free, anything that, that you think is bad or poor or not convincing, you let me know. Okay? Um, by the way, it's been an unexpected delight to learn sooner rather than later about Pavel's own work um, by accident because of this whole episode. Accidents are not something Aristotle speaks about in a complementary way in the context of drama, my talk today, being typically part of the worst kind of plots, the episodic ones. But in his other work, Aristotle recognizes how chance can sometimes be beneficial, and this whole episode has indeed been one of those uh, beneficial times for me. Okay, as the flyer for this talk said, I will give first the basics of the history of the word catharsis in Aristotle's definition of tragedy in the sixth chapter of the Poetics, including the continued failure of scholars for more than 450 years to translate the term correctly there. Then I would like to explain what I believe the solution is and how Smertl, a Croatian classicist who published the aforementioned book in 1937, contributed and helped set the Macedonian scholar, M.D. Uh, Petrzewski um, and me on the right path. Finally, I will give an update on my solution, which I first published, as Pavel said, in Oxford Studies for Ancient Philosophy in 2003, and which has been, as I said, gaining more recognition internationally, both positive and negative. Uh, and if I have time, what impact the solution will have on Western aesthetics? I doubt we'll have time. Um, I'm summarizing a third of a book in this, and it took me longer than I anticipated. So, but you can imagine if the tradition is wrong on this, if you know anything about aesthetics, literature, drama, and the history of uh, art, and what, what impact this has if Aristotle did not write that word. Okay, a little on the background of the manuscripts uh, for the poetics first will be helpful. Like some other treatises by Aristotle, but unlike some which were commented upon extensively by the sixth century, no one in antiquity seems to have cared about the poetics. That is, we have no commentary on it from either ancient or Byzantine times. It is, 
It is as if the Greeks and Romans found it of no interest, which is extremely ironic, given that scholars who write textbooks for courses in aesthetics in North America consider it usually, if not always, to be the most influential work on literature and drama, dramatic theory in Western history. And indeed, some aestheticians even expand this influence to artistic theory in general, sculpture, visual arts, and what have you. Take now the famous or infamous definition of tragedy, the seemingly paradigmatic form of drama for Aristotle and one of the three art forms he intends to examine in detail in the book, as explicitly said at the beginning of chapter six, when he also promises a discussion of comedy and epic, and only of comedy and epic, right before he defines tragedy. So none of the other so-called poetic forms whatsoever are supposed to be analyzed, contrary to what a lot of people think who believe it's a taxonomy of all poetry. Right? A section on epic, of course, still exists in chapters 23 to 26, but the section on comedy appears to be lost, although a few scholars like Richard Janko believe the Tractatus Quasilianus is that lost section. The definition of tragedy occurs after five introductory chapters within which Aristotle explains the three aspects of mimesis, representation, and then the history of drama. In chapter one, he gives the three means of mimesis, namely ruthmos, logos, and harmonia, traditionally badly translated in my view as language, harmony, and rhythm and really meaning for a host of reasons that I can't get into today, this was part of my dissertation, part of a Cambridge University Press article in 1999 that no one seems to have reviewed. It's just sitting there dead, as it were. And in that article, I, I argue that it has to mean, those three words have to mean language, music, and dance. Okay, so harmonia, K. Ruthmos really means music and dance, or tune and dance, which goes against everyone. But there was no harmony in ancient Greek music, if you've talked to the musicologists. Right? Um, in chapter two, Aristotle gives the objects of mimesis, good men versus bad men, or mediocre ones. And in chapter three, he gives the manners of mimesis, enactment or in, uh, performance, as it were, en enacted uh, on stage. Um, although it's not clear there, you have to deduce this from chapter six and other places, versus narrative, which is what epic has. And then in chapters four and five, he gives the history of tragedy and comedy and considerations such as the size of tragedy as it evolved. Okay. I give a typical translation now of the definition and the relevant Greek by Janko, one of the internationally recognized experts on the treatise. Again, this occurs at the beginning of chapter six after Aristotle has just finished the preliminaries and said, I'm going to talk about epic and comedy later. Then he says, now, let us discuss tragedy taking up the definition of its essence that results from what we have said. Tragedy is a representation of a serious, complete action which has magnitude in embellished speech with each of its elements used separately in the various parts of the play, represented by people acting and not by narration, accomplishing by means of pity and fear or sorry, pity and terror is how Jenko gives it, the catharsis of such emotions. Before examining the problems with the word catharsis here, and because the word pathematon associated with it, uh, or because of the word, I should say, uh, pathematon, I should mention that there are three existing streams of manuscripts showing different words for pathematon. One Greek manuscript often called A is Parasinus Graecus, uh, 1741, is from around the 10th century. The second independent Greek manuscript, often called B, is Ricardianus 46, from around the 14th century. It has a number of differences from A, but is very badly damaged throughout. The third stream resulted in an Arabic version in the 10th century, translated in Baghdad by Mada ibn Yunus, apparently from a Syriac manuscript from about the seventh century that may have come directly from a Greek one. The Arabic one often makes little sense in part because Islamic culture forbade representation of human beings and because mimesis in general 
and drama, of course, were representations by Greeks of humans um, that were completely unknown in practice to the Arabic scholars. However, this stream of manuscripts can sometimes be used by paleontologists to help settle disputes about the terms in the other um, two manuscript streams. To return now to the point about different words in the manuscripts, curiously, manuscript A, which is the, the best one, and which is the basis for all other 28 or so manuscripts that were copied after, um, uh, except for the B and, and the couple that, uh, there may be one other from B. Th these manuscripts have mathematon, not pathematon, okay, in the definition. And mathematon means learnings as opposed to pathematon, right, as experience or sufferings or emotions. I say curiously for a couple of reasons pertaining, um, again, to the word being coupled in the definition with catharsis and to its Catharsis, three typical meanings in ancient Greece, purification, clarification, or purgation. Purification is the meaning of the only other occurrence of the word catharsis in the whole treatise in chapter 17, when Aristotle mentions Orestes trying to escape the Furies by going through the purificatory rites. Yet no scholar, to my knowledge, in the last hundred years at least, accepts that the word catharsis can mean purification in the definition. One reason is that it makes no sense to speak of purifying pity and fear in this context. What would the characters in the drama or the audience identifying with any of them or both have at the end? Pure pity, pure fear? What good would this do even if pure pity is not a category mistake for Aristotle? One might have more or less pity, but to have pure pity seems to be inconsistent with the rest of Aristotle's psychology, aesthetics, and ethics. Purgation itself is the medical meaning of the term that was given most famously in the 19th century by Jacob Bernays, whose niece married Sigmund Freud. This is the most commonly accepted notion, and some scholars in the Renaissance had also offered it. By purging the audience of pity and fear, the dramatist presumably makes them more rational and less susceptible to the emotions that Plato considered harmful. Aristotle then comes across, at least superficially, as countering his mentor's well-known ban on both tragedy and comedy in the ideal state, which strikes many as another advantage of this interpretation. Furthermore, this is all in spite of Plato also using the concept catharsis extensively in his own ethical, political, educational, and ontological theories, for perhaps Aristotle was hoisting his master on his master's own petard, his own sword. A third benefit to translating catharsis as purgation is that this is the obvious meaning of the term in Aristotle's Politics, Book 8, Chapter 7, when speaking of musical modes, he says that he will explain, not just mention, but explain catharsis more in a book on the art of poetry, on the art of poetry, right? the title he gives it. However, even this interpretation of purgation quickly ran uh, historically into objections because, for instance, pity and fear are proper emotions at times, according to Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics, and one should not necessarily purge them. At the most, if they are too extreme, Plato's worry, one should moderate them according to Aristotle, and yet there is absolutely nothing about moderating the emotions in the whole poetics. There are a number of other reasons why scholars rejected purgation, including that Aristotle gives the goal of music and art in Politics Book 5 as delight. And this should also include tragedy. Hence, from about the middle of the 20th century on, a number of scholars tried to make clarification, the third option, work. Ironically, these scholars did not make much use of Manuscript A with learnings as the word Coupled with, cathar uh, coupled with catharsis, as they could have in my view, because that coupling on the surface arguably makes much more sense, right? The clarification of the learning. But even then, it is baffling how one gets clarification of pity and fear, as opposed to, say, a clarification of why and how the plot gets resolved. Moreover, even if one keeps pathematon, then one is clarifying emotions like pity and fear through pity and fear which is about as nonsensical as saying one purifies the emotions in, in drama, given the rest of Aristotle's theories. 
Other attempts continue to be made to resolve the meaning of catharsis by investing it with a combination of old meanings or with new ones. However, this immediately invites the response that, with respect to the combination of old meanings, we now get the worst of all worlds, not the best of all worlds, but the worst of all worlds. And with respect to new meanings, the Greeks and Aristotle did not use the term in these new ways. In short, a, signif a significant number of scholars continue to try to untie this particular Gordian knot. Some thinkers, though, are now pursuing a different path. Following a couple of German classicists who expressed their frustration because of the perennially conflicting opinions, including Gudemann, uh, von Willemowitz, um, and Otto. Smyrtle basically suggested, in my own words, that we quit trying to untie this particular Gordian knot. He highlighted how Aristotle's theory of definition in the topics and posterior analytics are not followed with respect to the inclusion of catharsis. That is, Aristotle breaks his own rules by including the term in the definition of tragedy. In rough, According to those rules, the collected terms in a definition are supposed to be explained to some extent before the definition collects them, and although this is true of all the other terms outside the catharsis clause, catharsis is never even hinted at before chapter 6. Smertl stopped there, though, without cutting the Gordian knot himself. That pleasure was left to the Macedonian Petrusevsky, who examined Smertl's work in detail and who, although differing from him in many respects, builds upon the Croatians' arguments to write in 1954 that Aristotle could not have written originally the back-to-back -back words pathematon katharsin, a phrase which Petrusevsky stresses exists no other time in ancient Greek literature. This itself is, of course, not conclusive because perhaps Aristotle wrote it for the first and only time. More crucially, though, in case one argues that Aristotle need not introduce terms before he collects them into his definition, which a lot of scholars do, they, they ignore that first sentence. They say, oh, it's not important. And in spite of him indicating explicitly that he is making the definition based on what was uh, said before, the term catharsis is never mentioned in the relevant sense immediately post-definition in chapters 6 and 7 when all the other terms in this definition, uh, except the catharsis clause, no pity and fear, are developed further to give the six necessary elements of tragedy, plot, character, reasoning, language, lexis is the word for it, music, dance, mellows, most people translate, like, translate it as melody. I show in my other work that it has to mean music, dance, like uh, uh, chorea or choric art, choral art, and spectacle. Nor is the term catharsis even mentioned again relevantly in the whole treatise, as I, made, as I mentioned before. Okay? Um, much less explained, as promised by Politics, Book 8, uh, Chapter 7. Petrushevsky stresses correctly, in my view, that this is particularly jarring, given that pity and fear are explained in Chapters 13 and 14. If there is any place for a discussion of catharsis apart from chapters 6 and 7, it should be in chapters 13 and 14, given the interrelationship of pity, fear, and catharsis in the definition. Yet there is no indication that chapters 13 and 14 are corrupted or incomplete, according to Petrushevsky, and there is not even a hint of catharsis there. The final crucial pieces of Petrushevsky's argument are as follows. First, Aristotle wrote instead pragmaton sustasin, a difference of a handful of letters. This phrase means the structure of events and is indeed not only introduced, at least as an idea in chapters 1 through 5, but is repeated many times in chapter 6 and elsewhere, getting cashed out as plot. That's how Aristotle defines plot which means Smertl's worries about rules of definition are dissolved. As indirect support of this, Petrushevsky stra cites Strabo, the ancient geographer from the first century uh, before the Common Era, 
who along with the later Plutarch wrote that Aristotle's library was buried underground to keep it from the book collecting kings of Pergamum, that the manuscripts were damaged by bug, bugs and moisture, and that they had to be repaired before they could be sold in the Roman market. The repair was done by people more in love with books than with philosophy, Strabo adds, suggesting that the repairs did not always fill in the gaps correctly. I'm glad Mariana is here because I know she loves books, but I think she likes philosophy too. <laughs> um, whether or not this is true, and there is much reason to believe it is, the fact that manuscripts A and manuscripts B have differences in the word next to catharsis, mathematon versus pathematon, shows indubitably that either there was damage or that miscopying occurred in the catharsis clause. The typical laissez-faire attitude by scholars toward this situation, saying that the uppercase uh, uh, pi and uppercase mu, uh, m, mu <clears throat> are so similar as to make miscopying easy, which in a way is partly true, which is used to justify the priority of the badly damaged B <clears throat> over A and its many, many copies, 20 copies, is not convincing to me. How is it that the many scribes who made the copies from manuscript A did not correct the move back to a pie? In, in, in any event, we can, we can ignore this whole paleographical issue. The combination of Petrushevsky's philosophical arguments are in and of themselves utterly devastating to the tradition that assumes Aristotle himself actually wrote the word catharsis in chapter six, in my view. Subsequently, in uh, not only in my view, but subsequently in 1969, a Portuguese scholar, Antonio Freire, published an article completely siding with Petrushevsky. Teddy Brunius, too, a Swedish scholar in the Dictionary of the History of Ideas, wrote wittily in 1973 that he accepted Petrushevsky's solution, but they, he thought it was too elegant and too reasonable a solution to be accepted at once by the professions. Sadly, though, rather than be slowly accepted, Smerdel's and Petrushevsky's work seem to have gotten buried as much as Aristotle's library was reputed by Strabo to have been, and it was not until Oxford Studies published my um, Purging the Poetics article that at least Petrushevsky's major idea seemed to have seen the light of day again. Smerdel's work I could only guess at based, as I said, on the French praise that uh, Petrushevsky gave about it, and it is only by having the works translated here in the last couple of weeks have my understanding of Smerdel and Petrusevsky been confirmed more precisely. I can now confidently continue with the history and the final draft of my book in progress um, without changing any of my conclusions, putting together everything from my dissertation, from Cambridge, Harmony, Cave Ruth Moss, all the catharsis stuff into this new look at um, at Aristotle's dramatics is what I call that, not poetics. <clears throat> so I'm not going to change any of my conclusion, one of which is that Smerdel and Petrushevsky were on the right track, but they did not go far enough. Rather, for the following reasons, not only is catharsis a wrong interpolation by some later editor, but the whole catharsis clause, including pity and fear, is inauthentic. Thus, unless, <coughs> excuse me, Unless we are missing the original correct goal of catharsis, of, uh, sorry, unless we are missing the original <coughs> correct goal of tragedy, perhaps the proper pleasure that chapters 23 and 26 uh, say both tragedy and epic have, the definition finished really with by people acting and not by narration. So just take out everything from accomplishing on to the end of that clause. That was interpolated wrongly by an editor, I claim. The reasons are fourfold. First, a trivial one, <clears throat> but we should get it immediately out of the way for any philologist. The grammar of the sentence can still be correct if that final clause is athetized, uh, that is bracketed as spurious. Second, pity and fear, like catharsis, were never mentioned before the collection of essential conditions in chapter six. Right? Breaks the rules of definition. Third, they are never discussed after the definition in chapters six and seven, 
when all the other conditions are discussed, except of course catharsis, as I mentioned. Fourth, and most importantly, even though pity and fear are instrumental and legitimate in the middle chapters of the treatise, they must be only crucial for some subspecies of tragedy because Aristotle in chapter 13 gives four tragic plot, plot types in order to rank them and says that three of these plot types do not even have pity and fear. Those three plot types are virtuous men going from good to bad fortune, he says, which gives disgust, miaron, not pity and fear, he says. Also plots with bad men going from bad fortune to good fortune, he says, they have no pity and fear. Likewise, plots with extremely, Svodra is the Greek, extremely bad men going from good to bad fortune uh, also have no pity and fear, Aristotle suggests, because we do not care about such people. The crucial plot type for my purposes now, <clears throat> uh, the best one, by the way, that does have pity and fear is the one with Oedipus, right? The modern, the noble man who makes a mistake has pity and fear. The crucial plot type for my purposes now, though, is the virtuous person going from good to bad fortune and not having pity and fear. Because there are many famous examples of tragedy like the Antigone of Sophocles that fall under this plot type. Virtuous person going from good to bad fortune. Aristotle adds immediately <coughs> in chapter 13 that pity results only if the suffering is undeserved and fear if the person is similar to us, which rules out the extremely bad man. Um, I don't know, maybe one of you is extremely bad, but I doubt it, you wouldn't be here. The suggestion being that they are not somebody we could identify with. <clears throat> I finished my article in 2003 by saying very briefly where catharsis may have played a role for Aristotle given the politics. Catharsis may well have been explained in the lost section on comedy given some common references in the rhetoric to comic analysis in a work with the same title as Politics Book 8, Chapter 7. Right? So in the rhetoric, Aristotle gives two passages about comic analysis. Right? And, says, and the words that he gives is the same exact title as in the politics. So that's the evidence why catharsis may have been explained in the law section on, on comedy. Thus, I conclude... Maybe catharsis for Aristotle was most important for comedy and not tragedy, all of which actually makes a lot of sense for reasons I cannot give today, but which, but which will be forthcoming in my book. Again, if we have time after the questions and answer period, I can give a quick intro uh, induction to this topic. <clears throat> However, I even grant that catharsis may have been applicable to one or more subspecies of tragedy, even though my arguments um, above demonstrate that pity and fear cannot be essential to all uh, tragedies. One reason is that Aristotle gives four kinds of tragedy in chapter 18 that no one ever discusses in detail. Complex tragedy, tragedy of suffering, tragedy of character, and spectacular tragedy. And I suggested that catharsis may have been the goal of some, but only some of these subtypes. In 2005, in the section on Aristotle in the second edition of the Rutledge Companion to Aesthetics, Nicholas Pappas published that he believed the time might be right for my solution, and he repeats his position in the third edition from 2013. Claudio William Veloso followed me in 2007 in Oxford Studies, publishing a, a work there, augmenting my basic arguments and giving different ones for why the whole catharsis clause is not authentic. Paul Woodruff, uh, in The Companion to Aristotle, 2009, gives my solution as one of the five possible ones that scholars should keep in mind in trying to resolve the problem of catharsis in chapter 6, and indicating in any event that we should effectively completely ignore catharsis in chapter 6, uh, sorry, completely ignore catharsis in trying to understand Aristotle's about tragedy, because catharsis plays no role whatsoever in the whole rest of the treatise. At least a few internationally known specialists in Plato have told me personally that they accept my basic conclusions, but since they have not actually published their agreement, I will not name them. 
Similarly, I was just informed, and this is going on YouTube, so I'm not sure whether I can say this because it may have been told me in confidence. So I won't mention any names, but suffice it to say that one of the top, if not the top, experts on the manuscripts in Aristotle uh, is publishing a preface to Veloso's new book, which is Eight Years in the Making, where he says that Veloso and I are correct and that this clause cannot be authentic as stated. Ironically, he gives, he changes the manuscript to try to make catharsis, as I understand, a quick reading of what was just sent to me. Um, catharsis, not the one and only goal of tragedy, and then he leaves it at that, which to me doesn't even touch all the philosophical arguments that Smerdel, Petrushevsky, myself, and Veloso have broadcast. Hence, I'm awaiting this, the official launch date of the book, you can imagine, with great anticipation to see what else he says, because I don't believe he, that the paleography can touch all these philosophical inconsistencies and contradictions. I just gave you the positive reception uh, of my work. Um, the 2003 article actually had three published critics, uh, Michael Pakaluk, an American professor who apparently focuses on the Nicomachean ethics, Pierre Destre, the Belgian scholar who does ancient Greek philosophy, and Stephen Hallowell, one of the internationally recognized experts on the poetics. Um, and I can see the way I'm doing uh, with time and because I want discussion. Um, I think I'm going to skip Destre and Pakaluk because they give just very cryptic, vague, quite frankly, and I'll say this on YouTube, poor uh, replies and criticism that really make no sense hold no water. Uh, very brief, um, and so I will, uh, with due respect, um, leave them and go directly to Hallowell because he gives two and a half pages, very detailed uh, <clears throat> replies based on the Greek text themselves. And, and if you answer him, you've answered the other two. Uh, because the other two uh, basically say, oh, well, Aristotle could, give, could have given oral explanation is really what it comes down to for them. And Pakalik says, well, there are other definitions, and Aristotle brings in uh, two other, you know, a, another term right at the last moment in these other definitions. So it's nothing different from the poetics that catharsis just entered at the end. The problem is Aristotle says he's collecting from before, where he doesn't say that in the Nicomachean Ethics. There, when he defines happiness, he says, I will add, he says, we should add now in a complete life. So he explicitly acknowledges he's bringing something in at the last moment. And more importantly, those terms in the Nicomachean ethics definitions are discussed after, which shows they're legitimate. Catharsis is never discussed, even never even mentioned after, in the relevant sense, after the definition, including places it should be, which I'll talk about more with respect to Hallowell. So let's just focus on Hallowell, and that'll save me some time and we can get more um, discussion in. And this was uh, from his 2011 book called uh, between ecstasy and truth. Um, <clears throat> so, if anyone wants to know what Destre says, I can I'll give you the, the presentation or tell you. So Hallowell has four major arguments against my 2003 article. But one of them pertains to the pity and fear issue, uh, and I'm going to leave that aside today because the focus today is more on just the word catharsis. And even Petrushevsky kept pet pity and fear. Petrushevsky said, no, Pathé Maton, Catharsin could not have been written, but he actually keeps pity and fear, and he doesn't realize all the inconsistencies that happened that I mentioned above, because he saw, oh, pity and fear are in the middle chapters, must be legitimate, right? But as I gave uh, before, um, Petrushevsky just didn't see some of the contradictions. So I take it a bit further. But without Petrushevsky, I probably would have never seen this. So I'm grateful to him and Smeridal for you know, clearing some of the forest for me to allow me to go further. Um, so in my published, my upcoming reply, I'm going to show not only that there are those three plot types in chapter 13, but if you start with chapter six and go through chapter 18, you find many plot types that Aristotle says uh, do not have pity and fear, which is shocking. People don't uh, just uh, recognize this. 
um, including the best plot type in chapter 14, which itself is not like the Oedipus, right, which ends badly, but which is like the Crispantes and Helle that end happily. Right? Aristotle also says in chapter 14, those are the best plots. Oedipus is the second best in that chapter. No scholar has ever reconciled that contradiction between chapter 13, where Oedipus is best, and chapter 14, where Oedipus is only second best. Um, Tragoidos, uh, the, the ancient Greek word, did not mean what tragedy means for us, and it could end pleasantly. Right? It just meant serious drama, in effect. And Aristotle acknowledges this uh, in chapter 6 when he speaks of plots going from misfortune to fortune. So anyway, you have to read the book uh, if you want to hear all the detailed arguments about pity and fear. But let's jump to Hallowell's second argument, which is first one uh, dealing with catharsis uh, against me. So he argues that Teleus in the definition does not come from chapters 1 to 5, so catharsis need not either. Okay? But let's look again at the Greek. So, uh, so there's the word at uh, teleus, meaning complete, okay, or whole. Um, it's a legitimate translation. Um, however, Halliwell in no way objected to my claim that hedusmano, right, the embellished speech, sometimes translated as sweetened speech, also enters for the first time, per se, as the word. Hedusmano had never been used before. Teleus never had been used in chapters one as such before. But the ideas, I claim, are before. And that's all that, that one needs, right? That's all that Aristotle's rules of definition require. Um, the Hedusmano actually gets explained right after this, where Aristotle says it's the, the harmonia ke ruthmos ke melos. For me, meaning the, the music and dance, that is melos as music dance, the, what the choral art does. Um, so, Hallowell, no, no objection whatsoever. But he says, oh, the, the Teleus is not there before. Um, however, um, Teleus as completeness or wholeness as an idea does get introduced in a section in chapter 5 on the length and thus the completeness of the tragedy, namely a single revolution of the sun. And that may not seem obvious until you read Further on, the explanation in chapter 6, what length, megasos, and com completeness, how they're intertwined. And the animal that's too big, you cannot see its completeness because of its size, it's too big, and so forth. So there's a lot of explanation on both megathos and teleus right after this definition, a full paragraph. So without question, teleus is legitimate part of the definition. And so you have to look and see that it was, not, it was only as an idea that it was introduced beforehand. But once you see that, then Hallowell's objection uh, goes away, is my claim. And more devastatingly, and I can show that there are some passages that are, seem to be missing from Aristotle. He jumps in the history from the choral going, uh, the choral uh, um, performers, and then to Aeschylus introducing an additional actor, two actors. Where's the one? For one actor, well, this uh, a later rhetorician talks about saying Aristotle did mention that um, the, um, Thestis was the um, Thespis was the first one. So there seems to be a little missing gap. So uh, Halliwell, as we'll see in the next argument coming up, accepts that there could be oral explanation and lost passages. Well, if he's going to accept that, then it well may have been that Teleus was already introduced in chapters 1 to 5, and we lost it, or, or Aristotle explained it orally. Okay? So if you're going to start appealing to oral explanation, be careful, because now you give me and Veloso and Petrzewski a lot of uh, ammunition now for our own points. Okay, let's look at the third argument, uh, which is the second argument against catharsis, which um, deals with, as Hallowell calls it, the prima facie problem of Aristotle not explaining catharsis anywhere in the treatise after the definition, contrary to what we should expect from politics, book eight, chapter seven. The solution for Hallowell, which goes back at least to Bernays, is that Aristotle could have explained the concept orally because Hallowell claims the poetics is probably a series of lecture notes. 
Halliwell rejects that catharsis could have been explained in any lost section on comedy, finding it bizarre that comedy could have catharsis, and claiming that I contend only comedy and not tragedy could have catharsis, which means he did not read the end of my article very carefully, because I only claim that catharsis may have been primarily relevant to comedy. Yet I stressed in that article, as I mentioned earlier today, that some, but only some, subtypes of, of tragedy, perhaps the tragedy of suffering in chapter 18, had a kind of catharsis. My view on comic catharsis is supported, actually, by the Neoplatonists, Iambicles and Proclus, who recognized that Aristotle countered Plato in his dialogue uh, against his mentor, both against tragedy and comedy. <clears throat> and the thinking there is that it was catharsis that somehow did this. More significantly, and to reiterate a point from above, once one allows significant oral explanation for the text, as Hallowell and Pierre Destres do, one then must allow Veloso and myself to appeal to the same oral explanation to handle any difficulty with our view and it turns out that the oral explanation for us is a lot, lot less than for the traditionalists, those who claim catharsis in chapter 6 is authentic. We only have to claim there's a couple sentences missing. They have to claim there are whole huge passages missing. Moreover, Halliwell's argument is absurd for two additional reasons. To begin with, Aristotle would then have no reason to explain in writing, plot, or any other important consideration in the treatise if he could have just done it orally. If you're going to explain it orally, why write it out? Besides, Hallowell thinks, as I do, that the explanation of catharsis could have come originally in the On Poets, an early dialogue by Aristotle. But Hallowell claims that Aristotle then just orally explained it in the Poetics, referring back to the early dialogue. Yet everyone believes On Poets is an early work and if catharsis is a core part of Aristotle's theory there, which it may well have been given the importance of the concept for Plato, it is simply unbelievable that, that Aristotle would have forgotten to write it into the later text, our poetics, when he is dealing with the goals of tragedy as he does both after the definition in chapter 6 where he says plot is the end of tragedy. And in chapter 14, when he says it is a proper pleasure that the dramatist strives for. Why doesn't he say catharsis there? It is also unbelievable that Aristotle would not have at least mentioned the term uh, again when he explains in chapters 13 and 14 both pity and fear, right? Which I already talked about before. It is triply unbelievable that he would have forgotten to mention catharsis when he gives various descriptions of the goal of epic and tragedy in the final chapter is always in terms of pleasure. Aristotle is there actually contradicting his goal as catharsis in all of these passages, and hence, if anything, were the, tree, were the treatise really only a series of lecture notes, Aristotle said orally he no longer held the view that he once held in the On Poets. He gave it up. Uh, and he had advocated it there, but it's now absent from the text, and this is why. He gave it up. Right? He gave it up because he moved away from Plato, and he got more sense. <laughs> Hallowell's fourth and final criticism pertains to Aristotle's argument in chapter 6 that plot is the highest-ranked element and is more important than character, something that the literary people hate. Right? How can character only be second to plot? Aristotle gives a few reasons why this is the case um, and why tragedy can exist without character but not without plot. Hallowell points to a sentence I never covered in 2003, so I didn't discuss this issue whatsoever. Uh, and the reason is it has to do with my Cambridge University article from four years before. And this is a sentence that, uh, that is the, the, the basis of the argument. So this is Aristotle saying in chapter 6, and again, this is the reason why plot is crucial, the soul of tragedy. Tragedy has to have plot, does not need character. Character is only second. Right? 
So according to Jenko's translation, he says, if a poet puts in sequence, speeches full of character, well composed in diction and reasoning, he will not achieve what was agreed to be the function of tragedy. And there's the Greek word. And the crucial part are these two words, the, um, the whole aim, uh, taste tragodias, right in the next to the last line of that paragraph. Hallowell, uh, and, here, and this is what's the problem with them, according to Hallowell. Hallowell indicates that I was remiss in not covering this point, saying, uh, and this is his passage, S4, his argument number four, Aristotle's appeal to the stated function of tragedy, and there's the whole in, right? Taste tragodias, ergo, oh, it should be ergon, sorry. I made a, uh, well, that's correct there. It's, cor it's not correct in my own. Should be ergon, um, okay. At um, chapter 6, 14, 15a, 30 to 31, is most readily understood as a reference back to the catharsis clause of the definition. If that clause were deleted, as Scott proposes, the reference back would have to be to plot as the end, the telos of tragedy. Hallowell adds that were the reference uh, to plot as the end, the whole passage would be vacuous and by implication wrong or meaningless. I have three replies to him, the first of which is too involved to give today because it requires showing what I demonstrated in a full article published by Cambridge in 1999, this one that no one seems to have ever read, about tragedy being necessarily for Aristotle a performed dramatic art requiring music, dance, and spectacle along with plot as enacted actions on stage. And why on this approach, Aristotle in this argument about the importance of plot over character is comparing two types of composition. One as Plato prefers, which is an arrangement of language from the Phaedrus. And the second, which Aristotle prefers, which is the plot as enacted on stage, which makes the passage very important on my interpretation and not vacuous at all. So Aristotle would allow that plot could be done with dance, right? Pantomime. Go see a silent film, which Aristotle was a little too young to see. You can get a plot in silent film. You don't need language. But dance, he recognizes in many places, could have a uh, plot. Uh, you could construct a plot just from dance. He doesn't say that explicitly, but you look at some of the passages in chapters 1, 2, and 4, and it's very easily deducible. Hallowell um, is trapped in the literary conception of tragedy with performance optional and something you can just see in your imagination. And so he simply doesn't see my point. <laughs> the second reply to Hallowell's criticism here pertains to two words in the Greek, which I just gave from Janko, uh, since Hallowell did not provide it, but they translate the passage the same way. <clears throat> okay. Um, so it's, and this is the, is the part, what was agreed to be. So Janko interpolates that uh, uh, passage. And this is a legitimate reading because the whole N is an idiom in which the imperfect may refer to a topic previously discussed. However, other translators render the passage in an equally proper way. He, the poet, will not achieve the function of tragedy. They don't use that other possible rendering. So there is no mention of a previous function. But for the sake of rigor, I grant, I'll grant Janko and uh, Hallowell that it, that it was imperfect and it was referring to previously. I could care less because there are four options to show that there is... Um, uh, sorry, there, there is a final solution to, to why Hallowell's argument is wrong. He suggests that the function, the ergon, and the end, the telos, are the same. However, this need not be the case and often is not the case, an option that Hallowell never explores in this context. Plot in tragedy is clearly the end, telos, in chapter 6. Aristotle says that. Perhaps the goal of the dramatist, putting together all the elements in combination with the chorus, but the function, the ergon, might be, and probably is, ultimately to give pleasure to the audience, or even catharsis, if you accept that. Once we see this distinction, at least four possibilities for the stated function, the ergon, of tragedy exist that evade Hallowell's fourth criticism. And I'll just summarize them now, and then we'll have discussion. Um, 
because this is it. So Aristotle says the function of dramatic representations is to give pleasure back in chapter four. The praxeos mimesis, the rep representation of an, uh, of an action earlier in chapter six has been proposed by Valin and Bywater, two of the most famous commentators from the uh, 1900, uh, 1800s to be um, the reference to this. And you could have had a lost sentence that we don't have that could have been the previous function. That was not the correct goal. And Halliwell, how can he complain? He accepts that, you know, lost passages is something you can pause it, right? Oral explanation. Or the legitimate goal of tragedy, which I think is something like proper pleasure. If that had been there, that would be the reference back. So there are four different uh, explanations um, um, to, to resolve that. So that's how I reply to Halliwell. And I would say as much to the paleographers as to Halliwell, if you wish to protect the manuscript, protect the full 26, cha 26 chapters. Don't just protect one word or one small clause that's utterly inconsistent with all the rest of those 26 chapters. Because otherwise you make Aristotle look like not only a first year philosophy student, but a bumbling one at that. Okay, let's stop there. I, um, won't go into the ramifications for what this means for Western aesthetics. I'd rather get your feedback. You know, any holes in my argument, anything not convincing, because that will help me patch and buttress the arguments as I finalize the book.